So at school we had been taught about the transatlantic slave trade, we were taught that slavery was abolished, it's a relic of the past, but that was just on paper. We weren't taught that after the formal abolition of slavery, new forms of exploitation arised. We also weren't taught that this is not just an issue happening in faraway countries and faraway communities, but it's happening on our doorstep right here in the UK, in the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the technology that we use, and potentially even on our high streets. Any survivor or person with lived experience that I speak to has a profound impact on on me as an individual. I think when you speak to someone with lived experience or a survivor, it humanizes the issue and it allows you that modern slavery isn't just a term that we throw around. It's an experience, it's someone lived reality and they have a story to it. Sean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. The first time I came across you, you were delivering a speech at the House of Commons and it was International Women's Day. Did a bit more research and then I, I began to know more about how you're quite heavily involved with international human rights, uh, particularly around topics of ending modern day slavery and also human trafficking. I think a really good place to start would be for people to learn more about you. So can you tell us a bit about yourself and about the work that you do? Yes. So my name is Ashan. I'm 20 years old. I'm in my final year of undergraduate studies at King's College London, reading international relations. Mm -hmm. And I've been in this sort of human rights space since 2016, which is when I first found out that modern slavery still existed. And since then, I've just been working in the space and intersectional spaces and movements to really engage more young people, particularly in terms of decision-making spaces and ensuring that they're centered in, in, these, in these sort of political spaces and arenas and making sure that you know we're really being valued as partners at the table. And can you take us back to that time when you first came aware of modern day slavery. So at school we had been taught about the transatlantic slave trade. We were taught that slavery was abolished. It's a relic of the past. Um, here in the UK, you know, abolished in 1807 and then in 1833 was the second act that passed through Parliament. So when I found out that modern slavery still existed, it was quite confusing because at school we were taught that, you know, it was abolished on the face of the earth. But that was just on paper. We weren't taught that after the formal abolition of slavery, new forms of exploitation arised. We were also weren't taught that this is not just an issue happening in faraway countries and faraway communities, but it's happening on our doorstep right here in the UK, in the clothes we wear, the foods we eat, the technology that we use, and potentially even on our high streets. And then I was sort of, I was quite socially aware at the time, you know, I was aware of the climate movement and the gender spaces, and I could see that young people were really brought in, oh, young people were really brought into those spaces. The anti-slavery sector was very much reserved for the academics, the people who collect the data, um, and the so-called experts in the space. There wasn't much youth engagement. And I think young people are one of those demographics that are vulnerable mm -hmm. to modern state of human trafficking, but also one of those demographics that can be mobilized to actually drive change. Yeah. And so that's when the idea for Stolen Dreams came about. It was a sort of a result of a project that we were doing at school. You know, we had six months to research a topic of our choice. Mm -hmm. I just found out slavery still existed. So I thought, let me use this opportunity and the privilege and the resources I have to do something with more of a lasting impact. And so, yeah, Stolen Dream started back in 2017, we launched, and now we continue to grow to become a fully youth-led, grassroots-led uh, collective working internationally to end modern slavery through education, advocacy, and policy. It's important to mention that you were 13 years old and you started. 13, yes. It's one thing to learn about something like this existing in the modern day world, but to go out there and actually form a collective and work internationally about trying to bring an end to this is another step completely. So what would you say was it about this world issue that really motivated you to want to bring about some change? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a really good question. I think from a very young age, my parents and grandparents have always brought me up with the ingrained of thinking that you know you should always give back to others, recognizing your own privilege, the resources, the life we live here in the UK, um, and, and giving back cons consistently uh, without the expect of any reward or anything in return. And those are principles that we're brought up on particularly in the faith of Jainism is, is what I was brought up with. And it's, it's uh, you know, I don't think if I, if I didn't have the upbringing, I don't think I would be the person I am today, essentially. And so that was a really important part of, of the journey, I guess, is that from a very young age, we were always taught and, and not necessarily about changing laws or forming organizations, but more in the immediate spheres that we occupy. How can we do good? Whether that's, you know, helping a sibling or helping my parents or, you know, doing the dishes, you know, those small acts of kindness or those random acts of kindness, I guess, that were instilled in me from a very young age. And so that was, I think, the, the basis on which my journey in, in the general social impact movement uh, was sort of triggered. And then growing up as well, we'd always been to India. 
Um, we'd spent a lot of time in settlements there, you know, okay. in schools and, and with young people and, and children in particular. But when I first found out that modern slavery existed, my parents then told me that, you know, you have met children who had either survived or were vulnerable to modern slavery human trafficking. That was quite hard for me to grasp. It was very easy for us here in the UK to go to a country like India, for example, to these to these areas and then to come back and uh, not do anything about it. And seeing the disconnect as well and, and seeing the difference in the life that we lived here uh, was had a very profound impact. And so I think when I see injustice, it doesn't sit right with me to, to just do nothing, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, we have the resources, I have the capacity, the time, the knowledge, the access to technology, you know, the, these, these various privileges. And I think using them for good is my path, essentially. Mm -hmm. Driving action towards ending modern day slavery and human trafficking, it is quite a bold goal and quite ambitious one. What advice would you have for people who want to take the first steps towards an ambitious goal? Right. I think ambitious goals are good. It's, it's always good to think big, I think. I think that's um, the place I would start. You know, when I first found out modern slavery existed, I had an existential crisis because this was, it's, it's an issue that's been hap in existence for centuries, essentially. <laughs> and I was thinking, how can I, as a 13-year-old kid, mm. have any impact? I think the first step is sort of distancing yourself from that thinking, knowing that you can and you will have an impact. Doesn't necessarily mean doing something on the international level, doesn't mean changing a law. But it, it just means taking that first step, right? And I think it's about understanding that whatever your goal may be, mm -hmm. you are going to have to adapt. You're going to have to evolve. You're going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. It happened so many times in, in the past sort of seven years in the work that I've been doing. And it's about having that flexibility, having that. I think the first step is about having that healthy relationship with failure. Okay. Because I think as a young person, we're always taught to achieve. We're always taught that we're supposed to get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and we're always taught to be in competition with everyone else too. And it's it's that narrative, I think, that is quite damaging, quite harmful to the space as a whole, but also to an individual. So I think having a healthy relationship with failure, understanding that we're all on learning, on learning and growth journey um, is probably the first the first step. And in terms of making a goal, it's always good to, I mean, at, at school we were taught to use sort of the smart sort of type goals where, you know, it's, it's measurable and specific and, and timely okay, yeah. and that sort of thing. And I think I, I use that to a degree, but I think, it's not that prescriptive and obviously it depends on context. Like if you're running a campaign or if you're just trying to do a personal goal, they're very different contexts. But I think the yeah. first thing to, to recognize is that you have to be flexible, you have to be adaptable. Things may not go according to plan. Where would you say that awareness came from? From just experiencing failure and from making mistakes. And I think there was a lot of pressure on me as a 13 year old in the space to okay. know the facts, know the, the data, for yeah. example, know what I was talking about. You know, modern slavery is a very contentious issue. There's a lot of nuances to it. There's a lot of political debates around it. I felt that I was expected to know all of those debates. And that's just far from reality is that, you know, every day you're learning, you're meeting new people, you're interacting with survivors, people with lived experience who have very different stories, very different experiences to tell. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just that awareness of, of learning. You know, when we first started Stolen Dreams, we got a lot of pushback. We put forward a lot of proposals. We were met with a lot of hard no's as well. And I think it was understanding that this is, this is life, essentially. This is going to happen, whether we like it or not. But it's about adapting um, and about reimagining, I think, and, and really clinging on to that hope um, is, is probably quite useful as well, too. On that pushback that you experienced, did you ever feel that people weren't taking you seriously? Of course. And still today, you know, by virtue of our age alone, we're tokenized because we're youth. We're the, we're the token youth young person that we get stuck on a panel or gets cons consulted for something. Because we're young and we're, we're a tick box, essentially. We get a lot of that pushback and, and still today. And that's essentially what we're trying to uh, sort of reinvigorate the space with, I guess, is, is redefining young people's role in, in the sector and this movement, also in the wider social impact movements too, and, and in political decision-making processes, is that we're not just here as, as your token. Mm -hmm. We're not just here because we're young. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have as much experience as people who are already well-established in these spaces. But that doesn't mean that we don't have anything to contribute. And in fact, you know, we need that, you know, reinvigoration, that reimagination, the creativity and the determination that we as young people bring into these spaces that have often been fixed in their ways for a, for a set period of time. And I think we do that from a place of concern, because if you look at impact issues like the climate crisis, for example, this is not a tomorrow issue, it's a today issue. Like, this is our future we're talking about. Yeah. And I think the way things are going right now, mm -hmm. clearly things aren't working. You know, we're still going business as usual. 
we're seeing you know even more aggressive impacts of climate change or human rights abuses i think there is a potential of young people to come into these spaces and, and really push for the positive change that we need you said earlier about it's about also initially flipping that thinking that thinking that how can somebody like me achieve a goal so big no but somebody like me can achieve that where did that awareness come from right i think i think it was so the the way i see it was that the mistakes and failures that we made allowed me to understand that i didn't have to be an expert in in this in this okay. field i had to have a baseline knowledge as to what this issue was um you know and as do most people whether that's in the corporate space or in, in the public sector but i think the ambition came from the small wins that we had. Okay. I think that was really crucial. The first school, for example, that invited us to come and speak to, you know, their cohort about modern slavery, that was a great win in itself. You know, as a 13, 14 year old, being invited to speak to other 13 and 14 year olds based off my expertise, I guess, was was quite profound. The first policy we influenced, for example, the first conversation we got started around modern slavery in our local government. These are all small wins that allowed me to see that, you know, we to have some value in this space, but also talking to other people in the sector and and sort of asking them, what are you doing to engage young people? They would say, we're not, we hadn't even thought of that. So then I would say, okay, let's hop on a call. Let's uh, discuss this, let's see what we can do. And seeing that actual willingness to engage more young people was quite motivating too. So I think it's holding on to the small wins and you know really making those connections with the allies in the space too, the intergenerational allies. When I was doing my research about your journey, I got the sense that you're quite mission focused and certainly from our conversation now as well, I can sense that. I would imagine that when you are working towards your missions, there's probably a lot going on internally as well to be able to achieve that. So what are some of the attributes that you've had to develop to help you do the work that you do? I think the main one is setting boundaries because, okay. you know, when you're dealing with a very complex very harrowing issues like modern slavery, human trafficking, where you're reading testimonials, you're speaking to survivors. It's a very depressing political climate at the moment as well. Um, we have to understand that we're young people in this space and we are in it for the long run. So the activism that we do has to be sustainable. Um, I've experienced my fair share of burnout of days where I just did not want to get out of bed or days where I curl up in a corner and cry. You know, these are like the, the normal emotional experiences that, that we face. And I think the mental health side of thing has been something that I've really had to get a grasp of because I need to take time out, I need to take time away to, to reconnect with nature essentially, um, to spend time with friends and family, to do things that re-energize me so that I can really contribute to my mission in, in a more effective manner. And it makes complete sense because unless you do something like that, then you're not going to be able to do what you're doing, but also find the joy in the work that you're doing right. as well. And so when you're setting those boundaries, for somebody who might be feeling like they need to do the same in their life, what, what what does that look like for you? The first step is always dealing with the guilt that you face for taking a break. And I face that quite a lot is that, you know, when I'm taking a break or when I'm spending time with friends, in the back of, the mi of my mind, there's a voice saying, you could be doing this. You know, you could be working on this project. You could be writing this policy. You could be involved in this process. And I think it's about understanding that you have to find your niche, your new, your, your area, mm -hmm. um, and really invest the time into that. You look at you know, in the corporate space, we always talk about outcomes-based sort of things. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at the social impact space is where can you best contribute to get the best outcome? Um, I think that's where that boundary setting is. And it's also about being firm with your boundaries okay. and having a community as well. It, I mean, I have a really supportive family. I have really great friends who know my boundaries. And when I overstep those boundaries, you know, they will call me and they will text me, they will physically drag me out of the house and tell me to stop doing the work I'm doing because they can also see that it takes a toll on my mental health, but they can also see that it's not healthy in terms of, it's not helping the mission. It's not sort of, they can recognize that it's it's something, and even colleagues at work can recognize that when I'm burnt out or tired, I'm not producing the best work I could be doing. Mm -hmm. And it just, it's a signpost to, to have a break, to mm -hmm. take a minute out, to have a breather. And also recognizing that while I take a, br a break, there is someone else who is there who's who's opening the door, who is, you know, keeping things going. And I have to trust that there are other people out there who are doing the work too. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you've got a good support system around you. For sure. And that's really helped. That's, yeah, I don't think, I don't think I'd be here today if I didn't have that support system. You mentioned about guilt as being the first thing that you check for people whose work 
and responsibilities mesh together. You know, maybe they are pursuing something, but then there's all, they've also got other responsibilities that take up a lot of their time. And does the guilt ever work the other way around as well, where, you know, you're spending a lot of time, you know, advocating and educating on these issues, but then are there other areas where you sort of feel, oh, I, I wish I had a bit more time? I think in this space, it's not a nine to five job, right? It's a 24 seven, whenever we can, we're working across so many different time zones, particularly with the UN side of things, everything operates out of New York, where you know London is, is five hours ahead. So that often means that I have calls until late at night. It often means that I have to sacrifice time with my family. Mm-hmm. Often means on weekends I'm working as well, um, juggling that with university, work, trying to maintain a social life as well. You know, there, there's so many different factors at play. The guilt does work the other way as well. You know, sometimes I think to myself, you know, I could have spent more time with my sister today, for example, or yeah. you know, could have watched that film with my family, but you know, upstairs in my room working because. It's just the reality of the space. And I think you have to find that balance. Um, and I think it's a very individual journey. I can't give an exact advance uh, answer, sorry, or, or advice okay. for, for someone, but I think it's about experiencing it, experience the burnout, experience the, the guilt, I guess, and, and find the balance that's best for you. When it comes to people's responsibilities increasing, do you think one's ability to, to manage increased responsibility is something that molds, changes, adapts? over time or is it something else i think it does mold and change because i think context changes as well you know when i started stolen dreams i was in school i was in in ninth grade so there wasn't much responsibility beyond just making sure i did my exams handed it homework so i had a lot more time then you know as you grow up i had my gccs my a levels i had the pressure starts to build and obviously applications to university first year university came and um there was a lot of pressure on social life, for example, as well, to stop doing too much work and do more social activities. Um, universities, a whole different sort of context as well in terms of it's a lot more independent learning and the reading and that sort of thing. And then I just started to take on more responsibility in terms of the work I was doing because I was just exposed to new spaces and there was a gap that needed to be filled in those spaces. Um, so I think responsibility is something that adapts, but I think it's also recognizing that any responsibility you take on you can also drop at some point too, depending on your capacity. Because for us in the social impact space, when we get into these positions of responsibility, it's about recognizing that we're in this space for a reason, because of our experience, for example, or because of the knowledge that we have or the benefits that we can bring to the table. But the minute we feel that it's too much, the pressure is too much, we feel that our ability to exercise those roles within our responsibility or within our mandate is too much, we have to recognize that there are probably other people out there who can sub in, for example, who can fit in and and also take on that role too. I think that's something that I have been thinking about recently because it's my final year of university. I'm also working at the same time. I have several different positions and responsibilities within the UN system that I have to hold myself accountable to. And I have a constituency of people that that hold me accountable as well. I have my dissertation to write. So I think the pressure is starting to build up and I have to now really map out what my roles and responsibilities are and where I need to focus my efforts or where my efforts are best focused. Yeah. And then sort of depart from the ones that I think I can't put my full 110% effort into. Um, I think in the work that we do, it's slightly different because at the end of the day, the, the responsibilities that we hold and the decisions that we make are affecting people's lives. Yeah. And I think that if we're not putting in our all into that, then it doesn't make sense to continue and we have to distance ourselves, not necessarily completely depart, you know, support from back end or, you know, play an advisory role, advisory capacity, but recognize that there are 100% other young people out there who are more than qualified, if not better than myself, to take that role. When it came to your work with Stolen Dreams, you worked on that for a number of years and you eventually got the attention of quite a well-known organization called the UN. Um, So what was that like and how did those initial conversations begin? If you had told me that I would be working in the UN space back in 2016 or or even before, um, I probably wouldn't have known what the UN does, to be honest. So when I first got the invitation to speak at um, a UN event, it was the 65th session on the Commission on the States of Women, which is the largest intergovernmental gathering of member states to advance gender equality um, across the the UN system, but across the world as well. Um, And the acronym for the Commission on the States of Women is CSW. 
So I was invited to speak at a parallel event focusing on trafficking in persons, especially the impact on women and children. Um, and they had used the abbreviation CSW in, in the invitation that I received. So I Googled CSW, not knowing that it was anything to do with the UN. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that came up was a Christian organization. So I initially thought I was speaking at a faith event. Um, and, and I thought that was the case because faith plays a big part in combating yeah. one zero in human trafficking. Yeah. So I was excited as well, you know, and then I got the formal invitation and you had the UN logo and it said, this is what you're speaking. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is the real deal then. <laughs> um, I went into that space with no expectations. I went into that space knowing as well that I was only invited because I was young and um, a man. And, you know, I think when we're talking about gender equality, some of the tick boxes are young people and is there a male or a man speaking about the, this issue as, as sort of like an ally role. Um, and I think I'm glad I didn't sort of say no. I'm glad I said yes, because at that conversation and on that panel discussion, I met a bunch of incredible young people who were working with UN Women in particular um, on mobilizing around then the Generation Equality Forums, which was UN Women's initiative uh, to essentially mobilize financial commitments to help invest in grassroots uh, youth and, and women-led and feminist organizations mm -hmm. that were working on gender-based violence on climate action and feminist movement building and a number of other different sort of thematic focuses. Um, and yeah, kind of just fed into that space and met these young people. We all shared frustrations about how we were being tokenized, how we weren't being taken seriously. Um, and then we organized sort of a separate event to tell young women that, you know, you can go ahead with generation equality forums, but if young people aren't being meaningfully included, then we won't legitimize your process. And we held this beautiful conference. It was uh, during the pandemic, of course, it was all over Zoom. Right. Um, you had thousands of young people coming together. We were really mobilizing. And the outcome of that was this beautiful document called the Young Feminist Manifesto, which essentially is a guide essentially on how we should be looking at systems thinking, how we should be looking at the root causes that are the root barriers and the structural limitations to young people's participation with a feminist lens. Mm -hmm. and, and that's been the advocacy that we take forward ever, ever since from that moment. But it, essentially, the UN space was not... Um, it was not intentional to get involved. It was very much an accident and have kind of been stuck there ever since. It's, it's definitely been um, it's definitely been great to expand the network. It's definitely been great in terms of getting that international exposure, a lot of experience to, to be in those um, political spaces, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I think the most important part for a lot of us who work in the UN system is about bridging what's happening at the international level to the grassroots level, but also bringing the grassroots voices to the international network too. You've had so much experience and you're not even 21 years old yet. How do you think your experiences with Stone and Dreams working with the UN has shaped you? I think it's given me a, a reality check and it's been very humbling as well, I think, in in a way where, you know, so we started Stone and Dreams as simply an organization or a website to raise awareness amongst young people. That was a primary aim. And then as I got more involved in the anti-slavery space, I recognized that actually we as young people are often tasked with sharing posts on social media. We're often tasked with raising awareness, but we're not necessarily tasked with, or we're not necessarily given the responsibility to actually take that online awareness and turn it into offline action. So I think that's one of the main experiences was that recognizing that we have more of a role to play than just raising awareness. And actually in terms of decision-making spaces, in terms of creating our own projects at the grassroots level, um, in terms of providing support to survivors, prevention, protection, it's, um, you know, we as young people play a, a major role in that. The UN side of things has definitely given me a very, very deep insight into how, into the political state of the world. Um, and it's given me a lot of experience, not only in terms of practical, about knowing what's happening in the world and the political nuances and, and the debates between different governments and member states and how that all operates, but I think it's shaped me in terms of even simple things like having a routine, having a structure to my life, for example, knowing what I want to do with my life. Those, those very practical and transferable skills, I guess, it's, it's really helped me. Public speaking, even writing documents and skim reading, you know, analyzing information, processing information, um, networking, talking to people, that sort of thing. I think it's really helped me with that teamwork, leadership skills. Yeah, I can, I can probably list so many more, but it's um, definitely helped with developing my character as, as a person, as, as an individual. You know, at that point in, in life where you're leaving university and, you know, we were talking about it a little bit before we started rolling, mm -hmm. that you're thinking about next steps. And I think you're in a place where a lot of people are in when they're trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. Um, sometimes I don't think that ever really stops. I think you get people of all ages thinking about what to do next. How have you gone about thinking about that? And do you have any advice for people? 
I think I've been deleting it as much as possible to think about what happens when I fall into the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Post-graduation. My advice to people would just be to have an open mind, I think. I think a lot of us go into university already thinking about what the next steps are when we graduate. Over the past three years of university, I've grown so much as a person. Um, I've met people who I never thought I would meet, you know, made friends that I never thought I would make. Um, I'm a very different person today than I was when I first started university. Um, so I think it would be having an open mind. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do with my life and yeah. where I want to go and what spaces I want to occupy. I also think, maybe, and I think this is because I'm coming from a background of social impact, is always thinking about in the space that you do end up occupying, what will be the contribution to to humanity, to the planet, if any. Um, and I think having that consciousness, especially for younger people, is quite important because a lot of young, you know, young, we're not a homogenous group. A lot of young people will go and work in the corporate space. They will work in sectors that are conventionally bad for human rights or bad for the environment. But I think it's about having, going into these spaces, having a thinking about how can you change things or how can you shift people's perspectives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that's very much coming from your purely, you know, do good in the world type of, yeah. type of narrative. Like I said, you're in a very similar position to a lot of people who are still trying to figure out their mm -hmm. path as well. And the nature of this podcast really is about people who want to pursue something, but they're at that point in the journey where they don't actually know right. what are those next steps to take. So we're really, we're really open about the things that we don't know, to be honest with you mm -hmm. on, on this podcast. We were talking a little bit earlier about the emotional toll that your work can take on you. And you work in a space where you really get to understand the com complexities of some of the most hard-hitting and harshest realities, unfortunately, in life um, and in the world that we see today. And I do wonder how somebody can manage that. Do you think that it takes an emotional toll? That's for sure. Yes, definitely. And I think it's about being in tune with your emotions and giving yourself the time, the space to actually feel. Okay. And I think for people that manifest in different ways, um, for me, that is just generally just sitting there in silence and having a cry because that's what it is. It's it's a lot of pressure that we feel in this space. It's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, sometimes it does feel like a burden, mm -hmm. particularly because I started this when I was 13. And a lot of the time at high school was me sitting there on Zoom calls, going to different events, you know, not going out with friends because I'd be busy sifting through hundreds of pages of research. And, you know, even today, sometimes I feel like, um, did I miss out on having those teenage years, essentially? Um, the fact that we are constantly being bombarded with information from the news, from from everywhere, from every media, our social media, TikTok, you know, it's just a constant barrage of, of information. And we may not necessarily be experiencing what every single individual is experiencing. But I think because we've been in this space for so long, there's a lot of empathy involved and we feel what others feel. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a great trait to have, having that empathy and um, being able to sort of put yourself in another person's shoes and then using that emotion to turn you know that emotion into action essentially i think yeah. that's the relationship i have with with what i feel is that i have to give myself time to feel i have to give myself to feel anger and frustration and to feel worry and then it's about using those emotions to then translate that into or channel those emotions into the work that i'm doing did you learn to do that from experience or did somebody give you advice to do that again i think it was my upbringing i think i was very fortunate the, the, the faith of jainism is all about meditation all about keeping in tune with your emotions it's all about non-violence and and really doing good in the world it's a, a lot of the the philosophy of jainism is based on science um i think growing up it's always been that it's always been that my parents, you know, used to meditate with us, you know, when we used to get angry when we were younger, you know, my parents would have a very proactive approach to, to, to that. Um, I think it is very much down to my upbringing as well. That's, that's really interesting. When it comes to the experiences that you've had, I'm interested to know if there was ever a specific moment or could be a person that you met where you felt that that experience had a direct impact on your life. I think there have been quite a few. I think... Any survivor or person with lived experience that I speak to has a profound impact on on me as an individual because I've gotten to the point now where it's it's 
a lot of the work that we do is very much engaging with governments, it's very policy focused, mm -hmm. um, or it's engaging with young people and, and telling them these are the issues that are happening in the world, here's what you can do to, to support it. I think when you speak to someone with lived experience or a survivor, it humanizes the issue and it allows you that modern slavery isn't just a term that we throw around, it's an experience, it's someone lived reality and they have a story to it. And I think that's what it really impacts me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, I think also going into schools, any school I go into and I see a 70 year old and I teach them about modern slavery, mm -hmm. you see the shock in their eyes when they first hear that it exists, mm -hmm. but then you see their determination to act. And those moments also have a profound impact because I am someone who recognizes that you know, so the UN, for example, says that by 2030, we should end modern slavery and human trafficking. A lot of people push that narrative forward. We're not going to end modern slavery and human trafficking in 2030. This is a very systemic issue. I think I'm someone who thinks that I would love to see an end to modern slavery in my lifetime, obviously. That's the work, the submission, that's the end goal. I think this is a generational issue. This is not something that is going to end in my lifetime. And I think I've accepted that. So I'm very close to falling into the cynicism side of things. But I think when I speak to young people and I see the hope and determination they have to take action is what keeps me going in this space. And that's the, the push. Public speaking, like I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, I came to know about you because you're doing a speech at the House of Commons. And I think it is an area, no matter what age you are, people can struggle with this. For sure. What are your thoughts when it comes to public speaking to start off with? Mm -hmm. It's not for everyone. <laughs> um, not everyone enjoys it and that's perfectly fine it's it's really it's daunting public speaking is um and it, not necessarily public speaking to a room of thousands of people but even if it's like a, a small group of people it's quite intimidating um i've done a lot of speeches spoken to a lot of people had to network a lot engage with a lot of people um still incredibly nervous you know the night before i ever give a speech it's always the worst case scenario playing in my head when you are trying to advocate for something, when you're educating people, I'd imagine a lot that goes into trying to be so concise with what you're saying and articulate. So you're really hitting the right points. What does that planning look like for you? Have you got any practical tips mm -hmm. for people? In preparing for a speech, one, it's always you have to know your audience. The speech we give to seven-year-olds is very different to the diplomats we give at the UN. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it just means adapting. Um, it's also a trial and error type thing. When I first started off speaking in schools, um, you know, it was very much me talking at the kids. And then I learned that actually it's got to be more interactive. It's got to be with them. It's, you know, break things up with doing a workshop or, you know, doing some something creative to, to sort of get their attention span um, stretched a, a bit more. But in terms of preparation, it's, it's just about knowing your audience, knowing what you would want the outcome of that speech to be or the outcome of whatever you're speaking about to be. For us at schools, it's always about, yes, awareness is the main part. We don't want to confuse them with the terminology, but we also don't want to understate the complexity of the issue. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about introducing them to a specific area of modern slavery. Usually we look at forced labor and supply chains. We pick a specific industry, either fashion, for example, or chocolate. Two things that kids love these days. For us, it's more about what is the outcome? What do you want them to take away from that? And for, for children at schools, it's to start a conversation at home around the dinner table. It's for them to understand that they can write to their local MP, for example, their government representative, um, and call on them to say, what are, what are you doing to engage with this issue? For diplomats, it's policy outcomes. You know, where, where the language you use in, in a speech is very important when it comes to diplomats. It's mm -hmm. um, what is the exact policy recommendation you want them to implement. So it just um, ultimately depends on audience. Um, and I think it's also about adding your own unique flair, I guess, to, to the speeches you're delivering. Okay, tell me about that. I think it gets very dry, very boring to just sit in a room of diplomats and listen to the same monotonous language and, and sort of phrasing being used where they're literally reading from a script and that's then published on a website afterwards. Um, I think it's about adding your unique perspective to it, your unique flair. Okay. When I've done public speeches, uh, sort of sort of speeches at the, the UN, um, I did one during the Transforming Education Pre-Summit in Paris at the UNESCO headquarters. I was given talking points. I was told this is what you have to mention. There were some things that I, I did have to mention because I was speaking on behalf of the UN Women and National and Youth Advocate. So there was a constituency that I had to represent. Um, there were certain things I was told not to say. There were certain things that I was told not to do. 
And I got onto this stage, onto this panel with the uh, deputy executive director of the UN Population Fund um, and with a, a, a government representative and another incredible young activist. And I looked out into this audience of young people, of ministers, of you know government representatives, civil society organizations. And I thought to myself, this is like a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm not gonna stick to these talking points that I've been given. <laughs> and I sort of just spoke my mind. And towards the end, it was an, it was a panel on gender transformative education. And I was the only man on, on the panel. And at the end, I thought, you know, let's do something, let's do something crazy. And I said in the microphone, I said, okay, if you are a man in this room, yeah. stand up if you are genuinely going to commit to implementing policies to do with gender transformative education. And I said, you know, you don't have to stand up, but a bunch of young activists will probably come running your way and holding you accountable. Yeah, yeah. Um, and people stood up in the room and it was this, it was this very big moment that broke from the conventional panels where it's just a and a type session and, you know, people say their talking points and then go off. Um, something as simple as that, just yeah. re-energizing the space. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it, reset, it completely resets the room. Exactly, so exactly. Not that people aren't really expecting, but you're still obviously trying to drive a particular point at home. Right, right. It's just a different way of doing it. And I think it's something that allows people to remember, oh, okay, at that event, we stood up for gender equality. We stood up for gender transformative education. I was wondering if there was anything in your childhood that you felt prepared you for the work that you're doing now. That's a good question. Um, I have had very strong role models in my life. Okay. Um, so if we look at the just the general principles of selflessness and service to others, that's been something that's ingrained from my life from a very young age. I mean, if we look further back from even before I was born, for example, my dad's parents came to this country as economic migrants. They came to this country. My granddad opened a post office um, and my mom's parents were kicked out of Uganda. They came to the country as refugees when Idi Amin right. expelled the Indians yeah. from, from the country. So... On my mom's side of the family in particular, there's a lot of that generational trauma that I think has been passed down. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also that awareness as to how they came to this country with nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother was held at gunpoint when she was fleeing Uganda. They had to hide their gold in pickle jars. When they came to this country, my grandmother couldn't speak English. She could only speak Gujarati. She was obviously wearing traditional saris and, and the clothes and the outfits. When my grandmother went to go and pick up my mom and her four sisters from school she was down outside the gates um and she would get racially abused yeah. she would you know a lot of vile things said to her um also when the whole family came across they all lived in in a house in, in the same place where my grandfather lived until he passed away a couple of years ago um but my grandmother took care of everyone she would always make sure that everyone else or gosh there must be like 13 to 18 maybe more people in that in the very small house living mm -hmm. She would always make sure that everyone ate first, even if that meant that she didn't get any food. Um, so I think those stories, and she passed away sadly in, in 2006. So I only knew her for a brief moment of time. So, but my mum tells me a lot of stories about her. And I think when we were growing up, it was always when we do something to help another person, or we do something as an act of kindness, my mum would always say, this is exactly what your grandmother did. She, she, embod she was a living embodiment of, of selflessness, essentially. And so I think a lot of, Growing up, a lot of the, the, and even the work that I do today is just out of honor and, and respect to her and the life that she lived. And I wish she was here um, to see the work that we've been doing, the work that I do. Um, and often, you know, I hear a voice in, in the back of my head or, or I feel her prayer. It's a weird thing to say, but you know, it, it's just, it's like you feel that sort of, that push, that nudge in the right direction. It's good to know that context because mm -hmm. listening to you from all aspects of your family, your your faith and the culture that you've grown up in, it, it's no surprise to see the work that you're doing now. Is there anything else that we should mention that we haven't mentioned from your perspective? I would just add as well, like on, on the point of, of ability and responsibility and, and also like figuring out what people want to do with their lives as well. I think important to understand that we're all on a learning journey and that also means tapping into new spaces that you think it's the imposter syndrome, right? It's like, okay. for example, something I'm interested in is tech and AI. Um, I read an article the other day, went completely over my head, didn't yeah. understand any of the words, but I'm not gonna let that put me off from engaging in that space. 
and recognizing that actually I can I can learn about tech. I can learn, I wanted to learn how to code for years. I've never started, but I think I'm going to start soon. Um, and it's quite daunting, but I think it's about it's always about taking that first step, realizing realizing that you are capable of of doing things essentially, and you're never too young or old to to start something new and to to find a new hobby or pursue a new passion or even a new career. Mm-hmm. I think and that links to having an open mind, of course. What you Lish just said now fits so much in the nature of this podcast because when I was coming up with my reasons for wanting to focus particularly on that side of the journey when people are not sure what to do next I was thinking I put myself in that position and and I have I have been in that position countless times I probably will be in, in the future but I was thinking that sometimes the feelings that come out of not knowing can actually stop you before you started. Yeah. It's interesting to hear your perspectives. You're aware of that, but you're not really going to let that stop you right. tapping into right. a completely new world. Or you just stay in your own comfort zone as well. And I think it's about challenging our own boundaries in that sense and mm-hmm. really pushing ourselves. And who knows, you might find something incredible that you really enjoy and you never thought you'd be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I can suddenly say the same for, for myself in terms of the, the work that we do now. Is, you know, told me seven years ago that I'd be in the space, I would probably laugh and be like, I don't understand the space at all. Um, but it's just about, yeah, taking that initial step and again, not being afraid to, to make a mistake or fail or not also being afraid to understand that you may not enjoy it at all. It may be completely off-putting, but it's just the experience. I think one of the, the, one of the mottos I think I hold now is do it for the plot. So it's a, sort of a Gen Z type saying, do it for the plot, do it for do it for the fun of it, do it for the experience. Uh, don't worry about the outcome. If it's good, it's great. If it's, if it's bad, you know, it's the experience that matters. So okay. I think anything I do now is always a do it for the plot moment. Oh, I think I've got my thumbnail, a title now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, thanks again, Ishan. It's been amazing sitting down and, and chatting to you. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me.